So here we go. We're going to, over the next few weeks, bang around on a notion that, um, I don't know, increasingly it becomes, I've become extraordinarily passionate about. And we're going to begin this journey in the fifth chapter of Mark. So if you've got your Bible with you, flip over uh, the, in the New Testament. So Matthew marks the second book of the New Testament. Uh, we're going to, before we get to the text that will be on the screen today, we're going to dig around a little bit in the front chapter, uh, or the front part of the fifth chapter of Mark. And uh, just talk a little bit about, uh, really, I hope anyway, what is a burning question in your heart and mind over the next few weeks. Because I honestly, the longer I live, believe that the world really is smaller than we think. You ever have that? This happened to Kelly and I about this time last year. We were in Jackson, Wyoming, and we had been off goofing around during the day. And we were sitting uh, in, the, in the restaurant upstairs, reading and enjoying each other's company and just looking out at the world. And this dude sitting at the bar over there has got a shirt on, and the shirt um, it says, Main Channel Brewery. And Kelly's reading, and I look over at the back of his shirt, and I was like, no. -uh. I mean, I don't know if you know how far Jackson is away from Gadsden, Alabama, but yeah, it's about mm, 1,500 miles. And so we're sitting there in the same space at the same time, and I look back over again, and I walk all the way out and started, like, creeping on this guy, and I'm glad he's got his back turned to me because, you know, I don't really know how this is going to go down. He's a big burly dude, by the way. Uh, he, he's not some handsome skinny dude like me wearing a suit, you know. And so he's sitting there, and, and, and I look at him just a little bit, and I was like, it is, and it says Gunnersville, Alabama, which is home for me, right on the bottom. I couldn't stand myself at this point, you know. I'm like po possessed, and I tap him on the shoulder, and not knowing what was going to happen, he reels around, and I said, hey, man, I said, I know you're going to think this is weird, but... Um, like, what are you doing with that shirt on? <laughs> you know, because everybody asks that whenever you know, what are you doing with this shirt on? He says, well, um, Gunnersville's where I live. And I said, really? Because it's home for us. And he goes, what? You know, and even though he was at the bar, I don't think he'd been drinking too much. And, and it, we're, we're completely, it's all good. We're standing there uh, just having conversation together. But, I mean, really, what are the odds that you go, I don't know, 15, 1,800 miles away from where you live, and you run into a fellow who, by the way, pastors a local church in Gunnersville, I did discover. Like, this just continues to get weirder and weirder and weirder. And uh, this, like, this is just a story. I bet you've got stories like this of how when you interact with other people, you find out that the world really is smaller than you think. And some days that's really refreshing, and other days that's really bad, particularly if you're on social media, but I digress. But it was hilarious to see that, and that encounter's etched on my mind, and I think that's true for all of us, is that if we really can stop and think some, some of what God's invited us to in the world, to do in the world, like if you've come up around the church, you know the end of Matthew before we get into Mark, Jesus gives his words to the disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations, right? And, and, and teach and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you always to the end of the age. Like, that's kind of our marching order, right? But the world seems like a gigantic place. I mean, there's only mm, 8 billion people in the world, and I have, like, how is little old me going to affect the outcome of the like, how am I going to help advance the kingdom of God in a world of 8 billion people? You ever have those thoughts when somebody like me stands up here and regales you with tales of what it could be like if you were, if you were just living a little more on mission? There's the overwhelming urges to say, but the world's gigantic and I don't really know how to do that. But I, I submit to you again, friends, the world really is smaller than you think and in the fifth chapter of the gospel of mark we're going to spend some time over the next um, few weeks looking at that and i think we're going to be able to demonstrate for you that jesus really knows what he's talking about and it's not really it's not really as hard as we think and so it's not going to be on the screen for you just yet but if you've got your bible on your phone or in your hand uh, maybe there's one under the seat in front of you if you would like it's the fifth chapter of the gospel of mark and it's talking about when Jesus gets in the boat 
from, he leaves Capernaum and he goes across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And anytime you're reading the gospel and you see what uh, this gospel starts off with in chapter 5, verse 1, and they came to the other side of the sea. Anytime you see that, you always need to pay attention to what Jesus is about to do. Anytime the gospel writer tells you that Jesus went to the other side of anything, if it's the other side of the room, the other side of the lake, the other side of the world, something revolutionary is about to happen. So just always be sensitive to when you see the words, and he went to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasians, you know it's about to be good. And so he got out of the boat. Immediately a man ran from the tombs with an unclean spirit that met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. Oh, this is a great guy, right? How about underlining dwelling if you have it in your scripture? Underline dwelling and underline tombs. Like what kind of brother dwells in the tombs? That's his home. That's his living place. And no one, you can underline no one, was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often, you can underline often too if you would like, been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains were torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue this particular man. So you got a picture of this brother? Like he is, he is a, he's a burly guy, I guess. Uh, maybe, maybe he's, I don't know, what, like what's your picture? He's about six foot six. He's about 285, 95 pounds. He just looks kind of like a, an, an Alabama lineman. They ain't going there. But you know what I'm saying, like a very intimidating guy for some of us who aren't such an imposing figure. And you start to think that like this guy, who, he, is, he is so deranged in his life, he, he has so much trouble in his life that, that somehow, some way, and I don't know if they shot him with tranquilizer darts or they sang him a lullaby or, they, or poisoned him or whatever they did, but somehow over time they had chained him over and over again, so much so put him in handcuffs. Like what kind of, what kind of guy do you have to be to snap handcuffs? and pulled the links of chains to the breaking point where they just pull apart. You're starting to get the, the picture that nobody could subdue the guy normally. And this is how Jesus, when he goes to the other side, this is the welcome committee that Jesus meets. Now can't you see this? I imagine his t clothes torn and tattered. He's probably, well, it says so a little bit further. Constantly, verse 5, day and night among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying gnashing himself, cutting himself with stones. You can, can you imagine this guy running at you, scarred up, bleeding, marred up, and just shouting all kinds of crazy stuff, and this is the person who meets you. In fact, these are the people we look for to be greeters here at Christ Central Church. Like, wouldn't you just come right on in the door if somebody like this came barreling up to you in the front out there? You're like, ah! Oh, you know, you're back to the car because not that it takes enough nerve to get into the church anyway. That's what you need meeting you at the door. I mean, this is what happened to Jesus. And I got to automatically think for a minute that Jesus just kind of, I don't know if he, and sometimes I picture Jesus wearing a John Deere hat. And, and so I just picture him kind of turning it around and pulling it down backwards for a minute. And, hmm, what am I going to do here, right? And look at what Jesus does. This is fantastic. And the guy here, seeing him, seeing Jesus at a distance, ran up to him and bowed down and cried out in a loud voice to Jesus, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torture me. Who said anything about torture? But here's the thing I want to get at when, we're, when we begin to journey off into that the world is smaller than, than you and I think is... is and you know me, this is just kind of how it works. How did this guy know that it was Jesus? Like you were in the habit of just running up to some random dude and going, have mercy on me, don't torn him. No, you're not in that habit. So how does he see Jesus and, and just know that, that this is the guy who can give relief? How does he see Jesus and just know that, that this is somebody that I need to have more than just a glancing Hey there, how you doing? 
How does he see Jesus and know that this is a guy who's not going to be scared of my overwhelming strength? He's not going to be scared away by my scars, by my bleeding, by my nothing. He is the kind of guy that I need to go and have interaction with. I've wrestled with that all week, and I don't really have an answer. And if you come up with one, I'd love to hear it. But the biggest thing that I wanted to do, just in this one particular verse, verse 6 is where we are, seeing Jesus from a distance. Now, I don't know if um, when the last time you actually saw Jesus up close or in personal, uh, in person, but, but this fellow sees him from, from a long way off and he charges to him. And we're going to start kind of our journey there and just say this, is that I think he charges toward Jesus because he's looking to put an end to such a miserable existence. Now, I don't know about you, but I, don't, I can't imagine living among the tombs and where they house dead people, by the way, and running around the mountains in the dark of night, screaming out of my mind and cutting myself with rocks. I just can't think that that's a very fulfilling lifestyle. I just can't personally think that, that that's the thing that he got up every day and got him motivated to, to get back up the next day and do it again. In other words, here's, here's, my, here's my suggestion to you is that when he sees Jesus from a long way off, something inside him goes off. And I think, and you don't have to think this too, but my question is, could it be possible that when he saw Jesus, he recognized that the end of a miserable existence was standing right in front of him? Could it be possible that when he saw Jesus, that somewhere deep on the inside of him, he recognized that there stands the possibility for me to have real life. Could that just be possible? And so let's jump out of the first century text into the 21st century world. Let me ask you a question. Is that, like, if he was on the lookout for Jesus, right? Because I, I assume that this fella had just been sitting there and was tired of living, tired of living a life, tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired all the time. I'm convinced that he was like that. And he, so he was on the lookout for something, anybody. And somehow he saw Jesus and recognized this guy might be able to point me toward real living. And so back into the 21st century world, like, when's, how often in our 167 mindset, friends, like how often during your 167 are you on the lookout for this life-giving Jesus to show up in your life? In other words, in your 167, yes, we're going backwards and forwards today. In your 167, are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you sick and tired of trying to figure out? Like, I bet you pray this prayer because sometimes I pray this prayer. I bet you pray the prayers like, Lord, why do you have me here? Any of you that I've talked to about the tribe, we've had this same conversation about values leading to purpose, about answering this question. about God, why do you have me here? I bet you pray that prayer from time to time. Lord, I'd just love for you to tell me exactly what it is you've got me here to do. And so my question for you is, in the 167, as it relates to our crazy friend in the tombs running around cutting himself, not that you're crazy because you're normal people. You're, you're as normal as day is long. But here's my question to you. In the 167, are you, in, are you on the lookout for the one that can bring meaning and purpose to your everyday living? Are you on the lookout because you're sick and tired of being sick and tired? And how are you, do, how are you on the lookout? And so I'm going to put my plug in for what we talked about in the 167. Uh, one hour this week is not enough worship for you to make it through until next Sunday. And so I'm just going to come back a couple weeks to say once again, like, how is it in your daily living that you've ordered a space in order to be on the lookout for Jesus? Let me say it this way. How is it that you're in going into the Bible text to discover where God is? is where is it that you're going in daily like how how much time are you able to carve out where you can where you can go into the word of god to discover 
the will of God because here's what I've noticed when you when you go into the Word of God and you discover the will of God this is what else I've noticed about it is that you'll find out the ways look out he's preaching he'll figure you'll figure out the ways of God and when you figure out the ways of God here's how it relates in the 21st century friends to our crazy buddy in the tombs out there how did he know to be on the shore looking for Jesus? Now, I'm not alleging he was reading Scripture because it didn't exist then, but you have a leg up that he didn't have. When you know God's ways, you can intercept how God moves in the world. You can go into Scripture and find out where you're standing down here, and it's not a matter of if he comes. Uh, he's going to be by here. He's better than a greyhound. He's more reliable. He's coming this way again. And so my question is, I push back across the table to you in the 167, are you able to, to go into God's Word on a daily basis to learn God's will so that you can understand God's ways so that when you are on the lookout in life that you know you're standing at a spot where God's going to come by? Because I think that's what happens to our friend here. And when he does, this is fantastic. For he says, don't torment me, right? We'll pick it up in verse 8. For he's been saying to him, come out, Jesus was saying this, said to the man, come out of him, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? Mark has this crazy language, right? If you get lost in the he's and him's, Mark is a terrible writer. It's, it's, just, it's not you, it's just the way the gospel is written. This particular gospel. And he says, and the man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to entreat or beg Jesus repeatedly, earnestly, not to send them out of the country. And now there was a big herd of swine feeding there on the mountainside. And the demon entreated Jesus, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirit entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the hill, down a steep bank, into the sea. And about 2,000 of them, they all drowned in the sea. Now that sounds like a crazy thing. Let me just give you a little commentary on that. So when Jesus goes to the other side of the water, those people aren't like Jesus. Those people, like we tell stories about people who live on the other side of the water when we're over where Jesus was. We whisper a little bit about them. You know what they do? They kill their babies over there. They're crazy. You know what else they do? They eat bacon. Oh, sinner, sinner, sinner. Like those are the people you never want your daughter to bring one of them home. Don't ever do that, honey. You stay away from over there. Like they live on the other side of the tracks and we live on this side. We don't mix with them and they don't mix with us because when you get their problems and our problems together, it's like an explosion. And Lord, they just better off over there. Right? It's just this kind of inherent bigotry that exists and so he goes over to the other side and and mark has to write the story in such a way to because these are um, historical biographies he writes the story in such a way because it's aimed at a jewish audience so what better thing for jesus to destroy than pigs Right, because pigs are unclean, and so where do you send an unclean spirit into unclean animals? Because they just deserve it anyway, so let them rush off down the hill and drown themselves. So just to give you a little bit of commentary and background for why it seems like Jesus did such a thing. And their herdsmen, verse 14, ran away. Of course, that's what I do too. And reported it in the cities and out in the country, and the people came to see what it was that was happening. Because you know the rubberneckers show up at every accident, right? Be honest, you're in church. You're not one of them, are you? Snarling traffic, looking across the barrier rail. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> they come out and they got to know what's going on. In 15, they say, And they came to Jesus and observed the man that had been demon-possessed sitting down and clothed. Now, either the disciples just travel around with a bug-out bag for people that Jesus is going to heal, 
or there's some lapse of time in here somewhere. Now, I don't know how you go, because I imagine the brother was in tattered clothes, living in the tombs, running around the mountains, cutting himself, doing all this crazy stuff. And, and, and I don't know how in the world, like, was the first thing that happened when he drowned part of the herd was somebody ran home and got the guy some clothes. I, I mean, I, I don't understand how this happens. Uh, but anyway, he's sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Isn't that a fantastic thing about Jesus? Like, isn't it a fantastic thing about Jesus that when you come to him and he does this thing for you, when you have a real life encounter with Jesus, that he puts you in your right mind? Oh, beloved, I spend a lot of my days thinking I'm completely out of my mind. The only thing that straightens my mind out is Jesus. And it's a fantastic thing to know that they're not dead first century words, but that but when Jesus comes to you and you have an encounter with him, that he'll put you in your right mind. As my brother said just a minute ago. That when your inclination is to wad up your fist, he'll unwind that thing and extend a hand of grace. Oh, he has this tendency just to put you in your right mind. And they knew who he was, though, right? Now, what do you do with the crazy guy who, like, this is better than uh, Otis, the town drunk on Mayberry, right? Like, you come back, what do you do all of a sudden? And Otis don't drink no more. Otis is as normal as you are. Otis didn't look disheveled and his clothes all jacked up. And he, I mean, he's like, you know, he's wearing a suit with a red tie. Like, what do you do with that? When somebody has an encounter with Jesus and the person you knew in the past is no longer existent, they, there's this brand new person. Like, it, it's, it's what uh, we were talking about in staff this week. It's called cognitive dissonance. When your former picture doesn't match up with what you're experiencing right now and you become lost. Like, what do you do with that? For the very man that he had was legion. And they became frightened. If this guy, in other words, can do this to this dude and kill our, our cash cow, pardon the pun, our pigs, but like if he'll do that, what could he do to us? And friends, I'm convinced that they had spent most of their time understanding poor legion as being nothing more than a first century version of Otis. They knew how, how he lived. They knew what he did. And now to get back into the 21st century world is that he had lived that way because he didn't live on purpose. And I push across the table. Could that be true of us too? Like when we spend our time praying of the Lord, Lord, what do you have me here for? What do you, what do you, what do you have me in this world to do? Could it be that part of answering that question is daily being on the lookout for Jesus and, and, that when we're daily on the lookout for Jesus, we'll finally have an encounter with him that'll answer the question of what you have me here to do. But listen, many of you are going to work tomorrow in your 167 and you're going to cut grass and you're going to cut hair and you're going to doctor, and you're going to nurse, and you're going to teach school, and you're going to do all kinds of great things. You're going to survey the world. That's how you live. When you work in all those fields, when you're teaching school, or when you're in retail sales, and God, I pray for you. Uh, uh, uh. And, 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 and. Oh, those of you who work, in the serving business. Lord, I particularly pray for you. But, when you do those things, that's what you do. You help other people. But doesn't it lend itself to this still nagging, burning feeling that you don't know what you're going on when you don't know why you do those things? And friends, I would submit to you this morning is that our old buddy Legion here, he goes from what everybody else knows is a, is a 
version of the town kook and comes to discover his purpose about how to help other people in this world because he's had a radical encounter with Jesus. Now let me say it this way. Is that when Jesus rocks your world, <laughs> he will make it possible. He will make it possible for you to connect with other people in your world so that he can rock their world too. And I'm convinced that he was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And then he runs into Jesus and he has this real life genuine encounter. He's clothed and in his right mind again. And everybody else is flipped out and crazy about it. And so much so that they ask Jesus to go home. They ask him to go home. Anybody? <laughs> no, you wouldn't ask Jesus to go home. But like, could he so radically transform people's lives? And, it, and it, so, it so changes the way they appear to all of us. Could it so scare us that we run, run for the hills? Could it, could it so scare us, church? So let me ask you this particular question. For those of us who had Jesus encounters throughout life, could it so scare us that we retreat into here and not engage out there? Could, could Jesus transform lives to the point that, that somebody who was cutting themselves and was an absolute disaster turns into as normal as you and I? And could that so scare us and so weird us out that we have a tendency or that we adopt a posture of isolating ourselves from the very space where Jesus does his finest work out in the world? I don't know. But what I do know is this. They ask him to go home, and then they pick it up, and this is where we'll get into what little bit of the text that we had for printed today. And as he was getting, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man that had been demon-possessed began to entreat him. You can underline that one if you want to, and you can write down beside it, beg. In the ancient language, what it suggests is, is he would not stop like Jesus couldn't take a step. You, could, you know how it is like when you tell your child no and they keep following you and wanting to know why, 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 why. Same thing this guy's doing as Jesus is going to the boat. And he begins to entreat him, wanting to accompany Jesus, friends. What a natural reaction, right? When Jesus rocks your world, what else do you want to do but get closer to Jesus? And that's a fantastic thing, and that lends it to part of the purpose that God gives us in life, is that there's only one or two ways you can go through this life. You're either going closer to God, and when you get there, it's drawing other people closer to God. And so if you're not there yet, you're on the mission getting closer to God, being drawn by His grace. And when you get there, whatever that radical encounter looks like for you, when you get there, when you have that moment where he sets you free, where he makes it, where you, you're, you find purpose in life, you understand why you're here, you get what it is that he's got you aimed for, you will want to get in his right front pocket and live there. When you see him go somewhere, you'll want to go somewhere. And I jumped just a little bit ahead in my mental notes, and let me just point back to this once again, is that and sometimes you'll want to retreat. You'll want to hive off. You'll want to get away from those crazy people who shackled you all the other time. Those other people in your sphere of influence that don't necessarily have the same encounter with Jesus, that don't see him the same way you do, your tendency will be to move over here and stay in Jesus' right front pocket and isolate yourself. And let me just offer this to you this morning. You have to fight isolation after you have an encounter with Jesus you have to fight it like your house is on fire you just have to fight isolation like your house is on fire because the tendency will want to be to wherever Jesus goes to stick right with him the whole time that we do but look at what Jesus does and we'll wind up our time here Jesus would not let him go in verse 19 but Jesus said to him, 
Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. You see that? You have an encounter with Jesus, and ready or not, he's going to send you to go do life with other people. Ready or not, he's going to exhort you to share your story of how he transformed your life. Tell them, just tell them what radical encounter you had with them. That's the other half of your purpose. So, you're, so the first part is to be drawn, to draw closer with Jesus once you have an encounter. Live right there with him in the 167. Carve a time out every day to be with Jesus, to worship him, to celebrate what he's done in your life. And as you do that, remember that he has sent you on a mission to share the story of the way in which he is transforming your life. It doesn't have to be this great grand story. Because sometimes Jesus, the radical encounter that you have, doesn't look too radical to you. But to the rest of us who've known you for a long time, oh, oh. It's sort of like what happens when people find out that I stand here on Sundays. They want to know what kind of church y'all are running. For real, your story doesn't have to be as radical. We all want a Paul story of be blind for a few days and then get baptized and be able to see and then go live off in the desert and get our life right with God and then come back and be this radical church planter. But listen, the, the beauty is in the ordinary life of the missionary living on purpose in the marketplace, in the schoolhouse, in the community every day. Those people, friends, are much more radical stories than what happens to Paul. And guess what? You're one of those people. And so here's what I want to suggest to you. Rick Warren says that God has clearly given us a purpose to fulfill in this life that cannot be done in the next life. And I'm suggesting to you from our friend Legion this morning that if you have to wade through all the words, you can figure out what that purpose is. Number one is to draw closer with Christ. And once you do, is to spend your time drawing other people closer to Jesus. If you need a per, uh, some reason to get up and go at the world every day, if you need some reason to go to work tomorrow, it's not how you do life. It's not what you do in life. But let me, let me just suggest to you that it's to draw closer with Jesus. This is why you do those things. To draw closer with Jesus tomorrow in the 167. And then figure out somehow to draw others closer with him too. That's what he's given you to do. Imagine if the world no longer... Listen. Imagine what the world would look like if we lived on, on, with, on purpose in in all the places that we lived daily, imagine what the world would look like when it becomes no longer consumed by fear or living in miserable, purposeless existence. Imagine what the world would be if everybody you ran into lived according to their God-given purpose, in other words. Is it, is it possible that the people of God could put network news and the cable propaganda machine out of business? Is it possible, just for a second, that you and I can imagine a world that's filled, filled, friends, with restored people, ones that no longer live among the tombs of bigoted thinking or the ghettos of race, gender, or sexuality? Can it be possible that when you live according to your God-given purpose, you recognize it's to draw closer with Jesus on a daily basis and to draw other people closer to Jesus on a daily basis? What could the world look like if you and I lived according to that purpose during the 167? What would it look like? Can you imagine a world where, friends, where children and our grandchildren no longer have to live about being concerned of gun down in the marketplace or in the public schoolhouse? Can you imagine what happens when people live according to their God-given purpose 
and they draw closer with Jesus and they draw other people closer to Jesus, what kind of world does this look like when we live according to those purposes? Do you think that just a few life-altering encounters with Jesus can start a revolution of love once again? Really? I know you wanted to answer that a little more resounding than that, so let me say it one more time. Can you, can, do you really think that just a few more life-altering encounters with Jesus can start a revolution of love once again? Thank you for indulging me. Can you see a world, friends, that look what the world looks like when just a few people begin to have a life-altering encounter with Jesus? Can you see a world where people actually bond together because they've banded together to live life together? Can you imagine what the world looks like when people begin to live according to their God-given purpose, drawing closer with Jesus in the 167, day by day, a little at the time, and also at the same time, drawing other people closer to Jesus by living on purpose in their life and allowing them to live in their life. Can you imagine what the world would look like? For friends, here's how I'm going to sum up our time together this morning before we rush on to the most important thing. It's our time here in communion together. But in Christ alone, life-giving purpose is found, friends. You may work your whole life doing all kinds of things, but if you never find Christ, you'll never find purpose in what you do. Life-giving purpose only comes from a living God. He created you on purpose, for a purpose, and with a purpose, and I'm convinced that the singular purpose of that is to draw closer with Him and to draw other people closer to Him. And so when people are on the lookout daily for something just a little bit better, when they're sick and tired of being sick and tired, Jesus, friends, is always faithful to meet you and absolutely rock your world. And when he does, listen, you'll be inclined, you'll be overcome with the urge to stay again right in his right front hip pocket. Wherever you go, boss, is where I want to go. But listen to what he says. He's going to look at you, and he's going to love you and be so proud of you, and he's going to trust you. Ready or not, here it comes. He's going to give you some work to do. And you're going to say, wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, it's impossible for me to go draw other people closer to you, God. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. I don't know enough Bible. I don't have enough experience. And he says, what encounter you have, just go share that encounter. Just go tell your story in life with other people is what he says. And he's going to look at you. And if you can calm your mind and quiet your spirit just long enough when the anxiety wells up, when you hear him offer you that, if you can just steal yourself just long enough to hear this, you'll hear Jesus lean in and whisper to you. He's going to say, only a life-giving God can give you life-giving purpose. And isn't it really purpose that you've been asking me for in your prayers all along? And as for joining me in transforming the whole world, he's going to whisper to you and tell you this. He's going to say, trust me, the world? Oh, it's way smaller than you think. And next week, we're going to find out just how small it is. Or would it be that he'd have you share your story with just a few and all of us doing that brings how the world is transformed for the glory of God.